I'm really thankful uh, for having uh, Professor Dirk Helbing with us. He is uh, from ETH Zürich, uh, a professor for computational science. And he's a real expert on big data. And I'm really thankful for Tom Pitfield, who said uh, he really fights the fear mongering on data. And so it's good that we have a session on big data and what it means actually for uh, the future and can we trust the future. Uh, Professor Helbing is a real expert. He is part of the German Academy of Science, uh, Leopoldina. He uh, is uh, also in the World Academy of Art and Science uh, since 2016. His work has been cited and has been quoted uh, in the media and academia, uh, in nature and science. And uh, he also has a very uh, uh, interesting program running uh, in Delft. So uh, I'm really thankful that he made his way from Zurich over. And he's going to talk about uh, what actually digital and personalized big data means in the communication and what is uh, at stake when it comes to democracy. And uh, so I'm really thankful that he's here. He will give us a really good uh, approach after the lunch. So give a big hand of applause for Dirk Henning. Yes, good. Good afternoon. So Get me Roger Stone, that's maybe a movie that you've seen and you've also seen what happened recently. So on the news uh, it was reported that Roger Stone was arrested. You can see that campaign managers have been uh, seeing safer times. So uh, all, all has become a little bit more dangerous these days. So I'll talk about personalized outreach with uh, big data, opportunities, risks, trials and tribulations. We are certainly living in a time of big data, but not only this, also artificial intelligence is becoming ever more important. Some people expect that we would have super intelligence systems pretty soon. Some of those systems influence affairs globally, and that's basically the state of affairs when it comes to robotics. Um, so AI and robotics is certainly on its way and primarily that's a good thing but let's see what somebody has to say who knows a lot about robots and a lot about politics which is Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> right so he's played uh, in this Terminator movie but he's also written this letter over here and tell me if you notice anything in this letter don't want to spend too much time but have a look at this so basically if you read it this way <laughs> then he has a hidden message <laughs> and these kind of messages do influence people without them even noticing because 95 percent of the information that's that we're exposed to is not being consciously uh, consciously processed this allows basically to subconsciously influence people and of course that's something that's being used in marketing and can be used also to influence people and it's basically used all the time so here are just some examples it's basically about sex, sex, sex um, and you may say that's what I saw such a thing could never happen in politics and here's the counter example <laughs> and um, this, this kind of marketing has been invented a long time ago where you basically try to connect two different things with each other for example cars with sexiness and this is the way you can sell cars more expensively and the science behind this is pretty old 100 years old and it goes back to Edward Bernays and others a nephew of Sigmund Freund and that's the same kind of science that has been used basically uh, to create mass psychology and unfortunately it was part of the Third Reich in Germany uh, using also this new device the Volksempfänger I mean the radio that people haven't had before and that has promoted propaganda to a new level and it ended as we know in the Second World War, and Holocaust, and many bad things. 
Now, in the meantime, of course, people are adjusted to these kinds of media, but also media have become much more sophisticated. So basically now we have robotic reporting in parts, we have personalized reporting, we have botnets with hundreds of thousands of nodes, and we have Barack Obama warning that this is also the time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack. I mean, notions of objectivity and of free press and of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined or in some cases ignored entirely. And he asks people to dig deeper and question, and that's what I'm trying to do over here. Shortly after his correspondence dinner speech in 2016, we entered the fact-free world, as we call it now, where alternative facts basically <coughs> spread, where fake news spreads, and this is something that was already described in 1984 of George Orwell. And unfortunately, fake news is sometimes more interesting than real news, and that's why lies tend to spread more quickly. And in such a climate, we have to ask the question, will democracy survive big data and artificial intelligence? And uh, we've therefore written this digital manifesto in Spectrum der Wissenschaft, end of 2015. So what had happened? It all started pretty harmless, where basically every political party uh, was uh, posting posters and uh, people had to decide between those different parties. But then we entered this age of big data. And in fact, a lot of this data is personal data. And CIA Director Gus Hunt at that time reminded us, I was back in 2013, that basically all information, human-generated information, is basically processed by the CIA. <coughs> and we're walking sensor platforms. That means your smartphone is reporting about your behavior all the time, actually every day between hundreds of megabytes and a couple of gigabytes. That's quite a lot of data. And that basically is shaping digital doubles. So there's a digital copy of each of us in some supercomputers that behave similarly to us. And one can make experiments in a computer with these uh, digital doubles in order to figure out how to make them do certain kind of things. And that kind of strategy could be applied also <coughs> to real people. Now, Julian Assange has uh, reported that this kind of technology has made its way out of the hands of the CIA. It's being used in all sorts of places. That was the World 7 revelation. Now we have a number of companies, not just Cambridge Analytica, that knew quite a bit about people. And Google, of course, knows even more in Facebook about us. And even if you're not a member of Facebook, a lot of data will be collected about you by that company. This kind of data can be used for personalization. That means um, every one of us sees the internet in different ways. When you Google, when you look at news streams and social media, but also if you book hotels or flights or whatever, and even Newspaper articles may have different titles, um, pictures, uh, and content. And this is basically what we saw from this. So basically, yes, it's possible to influence people. And that's attractive, of course, uh, for marketing. But the question is now, how far should we go? We are certainly in the age of neuromarketing, and mind control to some extent is possible. Of course, it's not working perfectly. Uh, but with artificial intelligence and big data, it's possible to influence our opinions, our decision making, <coughs> our behaviors. And so that's uh, basically the field of social engineering. And some people thought, well, actually, that's a good thing to control the world because this is the way to optimize it. And these kind of people often said democracy is an outdated technology and we need to replace it by something else, by something which they thought was 
a better system. And Peter Thiel even said, we're in a deadly race between politics and technology. Because you want to use technology to support politics, but there are some people who think, you know, we should get rid of politics altogether and have AI systems decide what needs to be done. Now, if you think I'm exaggerating, then I recommend you this movie by Kristen Harris, a very nice TEDx talk, uh, where he explains how a handful of tech companies controls billions of minds every day, including yours, most likely. And he has been working in a Google control room. He knows how it works. So basically, uh, we have now something like digital scepters that allow to influence people's thinking and decision making. And there's also science backing this up. So you know, it's, I'm not making this up. Uh, this is based on facts. Um, you like it or not. And this allows Google and many other companies to influence uh, people's decision making and thinking. So in this case, there is a spreading of a right-wing bias. We don't know whether that's by intention or by mistake. We do know that AI uh, is sometimes biased, that there are discrimination effects and all this, but it can be used in principle to influence elections. And there is some evidence that this has actually happened, or at least been attempted, and uh, it started um, about back in 2012, maybe even earlier, and there big data was used to figure out who would vote for what political party, and who was undecided. Of course, in democracies we should have anonymous votes, so that has gone with big data already, and then eventually 45 data analytics experts were employed in order to help Obama win the elections. And people were influenced in their decision making, there are even scientific publications that are proud of a 61 million person experiment, and this is exactly about these kind of elections. So this has been going on not only in the United States, but also in South America, in uh, Great Britain, I would say, in Turkey. And it's better not talk about Germany and France, because most likely a similar technology has also been used in the background over here. But nobody got upset about this uh, for a couple of years. Most people even didn't know about it, so they couldn't get upset. But Eventually, what happened was this, the Brexit decision. And a lot of people were shocked. It broke Europe apart into pieces. And eventually, people realized that there was technology to influence people's opinions. And that uh, what was used over here is something like a weaponized propaganda AI that knows you better than you know yourself. We're talking about military technology, military information war over here, and here are a number of newspaper articles that confirm that this is happening, and in principle you should be able to know it since Snowden, when he was releasing information about uh, JTRIC um, by the GCHQ, and here it was described how people's minds could be influenced, how people could be tricked, and there are a lot of ways to do that. So these have been figured out basically, and they can be applied in order to trick people because uh, we have a lot of cognitive biases. Our brain runs on just 100 watts and does wonderful things, but it takes shortcuts, and those shortcuts can be basically used to, to trick us to believe certain kind of things. And that has been eventually applied also to election campaigns to some extent. And basically, everyone was collected with different messages in order to vote for a certain political party. And not always were those messages consistent with each other. So this was really tricking people. And these are tools of propaganda, of information war. And uh, we have to realize that these chain tricks technologies are now scalable, they can be applied to hundreds of millions of people at the same time. So this is very powerful, 
And Putin has reminded us that the leader in artificial intelligence will rule the world. Now you understand maybe what he had in mind when he said that. But you know, let's not always point fingers at uh, the Russians uh, because they're not the only ones meddling with elections. The CIA is doing that too, and militaries around the world, and even uh, circles around the Queen. So basically, we're in a situation where a aristocracy, you know, seems to try to decide what comes out in the democratic election. So we're basically back to square one to some extent, right? Now, CIA really has a history of election meddling. They're doing it since the 40s. And the kind of technology that they're using actually has maybe started off with Operation Paperclip. I mean, after the Second World War, when a lot of Nazi scientists and engineers were taken over to not only the United States, but also to other countries. And then they have started to work on mind control programs. So I have that from the CIA side, so it should be reliable, I hope, the information. So what, what is this mind control about? Basically, we're being exposed to experiments every day. It's called A-B testing. So in this way, it's being figured out how we can be most effectively manipulated to buy a certain product um, or to look at this piece of news or to vote for a certain kind of political party. So while in the 30s of last century, animals were put into these Skinner boxes in order to expose them to rewards and punishments and make them do certain kind of things. This is now happening to us. We are now the uh, guinea pigs in a sense, and the Skinner boxes we have been locked into are the filter bubbles. We don't see them, we can't feel them. It actually is quite comfortable to live in this personalized information world, and we don't notice that sometimes somebody is trying to expose us to a certain kind of information that would feel like we have made this decision ourselves, but in fact somebody else has triggered this, and this is called nudging. And if you think, oh, those bad things only happen in Russia or China or in Silicon Valley, totally wrong. In Berlin we have companies such as this one and many more who are also working on this, so this is happening in various applications and eventually politics has woken up to it and uh, there have been critical voices, for example, um, Bosbach and Steinmeier have been really concerned, and Demisier as well, and uh, Martin Schulz even said, we now have to fight against technological totalitarianism, but unfortunately during this election campaign that he was running, he, I believe, never mentioned this again. So. Um, now, the current justice minister is also pretty much concerned about the use of social bots and manipulation, and she has recently made a statement, uh, you've seen the debate in the newspaper, where she basically said, uh, we shouldn't be guinea pigs of a company, so there will be laws uh, in the uh, near future, I guess, that protects us better from such kind of things. But there are also critical voices in the business arena. For example, Tim Cook doesn't like this manipulation by Google and Facebook. He criticized it quite a lot. He said, uh, our data are being used like weapons against us. Even Larry Page of Google had something to criticize about European telecommunication companies who wanted to collect a lot of personal data uh, to have personalized advertisement and influence us just in the right moment uh, where we would be uh, best to influence. And John Parker, who was a manager at Facebook, says this company exploits vulnerability in human psychology. George Soros, on the other hand, uh, even talks about uh, the end of civilization. Uh, I don't want to be alarmist, I just said to people, you know. <laughs> and, and, and here he, he has been just recently attacking uh, China's president for what? Well, basically for this 
technological totalitarianism that comes under the name of, of uh, social credit score, where basically everything people do or don't do based on mass surveillance would get plus or minus points, and it would really be used to control people's lives and to create a new kind of social hierarchy based on how well you comply with what the state or the president wants from you. I've read a lot about the system, so I don't repeat it in detail over here. I also want to mention the public and uh, legal response. So there have been experiments at Facebook on massive scale emotional contagion. People were very angry about it. Um, and uh, it might have been even illegal, so even uh, state attorneys basically were looking into this case and eventually we've uh, come into a situation where people started to distrust IT technology, big data altogether. Facebook, for example, lost 100 billion in just 24 hours. That is basically the outcome of this development. Now, a lot of things have happened since then. I don't want to negate that at all. So, uh, for example, after the last election, um, after Algorithm Watch has been looking into Google queries and uh, the results of those, it was said German election was not influenced, but is it really so? Just recently, there was another article that uh, said, oh, no, I, I'm not sure, I, I dropped maybe that slide. So, in, in fact, there, there is most likely still some digital doping going on. I mean, the, the, the political doping, of course, by non-political parties is quite old. I'm not sure who remembers actually this advertisement. So that, that was posted in an election maybe 12 or 16, sir? 2013. Okay, so many years ago and um, in the meantime, of course, we see these things much more critical as we have seen in connection with the discussion about uh, the tools and means of and strategies of IFD. We've been uh, basically benefiting from free of charge um, news that was distributed in favor of them. And in the meantime, that's also a legal case and um, this is a serious thing. Yeah, so do we have this behind us? Probably not. Also, again, in Berlin, even in Berlin, there's a company that is actually doing social listening on everything that's going on in the internet, and that's not only doing this, they're also influencing people's debates with social bots. So, just around the corner, all of that technology in, in every country, I can assure you. Uh, this is going on. So, I'm a bit concerned about it, I should say. I do think big data and also artificial intelligence can be used for good, and we should do that, but we need to be careful how we use it and how far we go. Possible solutions. So, first of all, we should regain control of our personal data, of our digital duple. So we need to have a platform for informational self-determination that allows us to decide what companies, what institutions would have access to what pieces of our personal data for what purpose, period of time, and also payment. We would have digital assistants or personalized AI systems running on our devices that help us manage our personal data to make it comfortable these assistants would learn our preferences, whom we trust and whom we don't trust. Companies and institutions would be in a competition for our trust that would lead to a trusted digital society. And at the same time, the wells of big data would become accessible not only to big business, but also to SMEs, to spin-off companies, to scientific institutions, to NGOs, to civil society. So everyone would benefit from this and we would regain 
informational self-determination. We could decide how much personalization we want and what parameters would be used to personalize matches, the messages for us, right? So nothing against personalization, just give people back control. But we can do more. So how to make democracy work in the digital age? We need to upgrade democracy digitally. We need to learn to design for values, for constitutional, for cultural values, for cooperation, fairness, trust, and truth. We need to build digital platforms in such a way that they're consistent with democracy. I personally think these are some of the features that really matter, human rights, human dignity, freedom, self-determination, <coughs> pluralism, protection of minorities, division of power, checks and balances, participation, transparency, fairness, justice, legitimacy, equal votes and privacy, in the, in the sense of protection from misuse and exposure and the right to be left alone. So, moreover, politics need to adjust to the fact that our systems become ever more complex. So, even though processing power is increasing exponentially, Data volume is increasing even faster. That means we cannot process it all. We need to select what kind of data we process and how. And systemic complexity is increasing even faster because we network the system. And that's why we cannot control the world successfully in a top-down way. We need to have a new approach, which is um, bottom-up um, self uh, control basically self-organization and I will show you some examples so in such a highly networked system whatever you do does not necessarily cause the intended effect but there will also be side effects there will be feedback effects there will be cascading effects um, there are limits of predictability there's an, an illusion of control and such kind of complex systems cannot be steered like a car right we need to be aware of this. So we need a new paradigm. And I think we should go, or need to go from top-down control to empowerment and coordination. This is a paradigm shift and will become ever more important the longer this digital transformation goes on. So we need to go away from these over-determined, over-regulated systems and learn to build systems that support good decisions and support self-organization. Here's a very funny example, actually. And you see that nobody has to stop over here because this is a surprisingly good design. We have a unidirectional <laughs> flow in the front, unidirectional flow in the back, and a buffer that allows everyone to adjust in such a way the speed that they would find a gap when they want to cross the flow. Now, these kind of systems can now be built with the Internet of Things in a much safer and better way. Um, and also these kind of systems become within the reach of technology. That means we can build self-organizing, uh, self self-governing system, and my team has actually worked on a number of these systems, and some of them are implemented even. We know, since Eleanor Ostrom at least, that Self-governance can be efficient if proper design principles are applied. And that means we should engage more with civil society, we should engage more locally, I've also heard that in some previous talks, and I think we should reflect again about what democracy should be about, why it has been invented, and uh, we should also reflect about the role of parties. There is just one article in the Constitution of Germany, which is about political parties, and um, it just says it should help people to find their point of view, and nothing else. It's not about control or anything like this, right? And so, what should representative democracy mean? It shouldn't mean that every four years we go and vote and then we basically we have voted for something like a king or a queen that then decides what happens in this country, right? Um, we shouldn't have a politics without alternatives. We, we should have pluralism, we should have diversity and that has sometimes been questioned in recent years and I think representative 
that the democracy should mean that the different points of view and interests of the people <coughs> should be ideally proportionally represented in the parliament in order to have decisions that basically map the kind of decisions that the people would take. This has been very much undermined and uh, partly because we have uh, um, a party-based, a party-run system, a coalition-based system, but people don't vote for coalitions, you know. Their expectations go beyond coalitions. They, they want that basically their points of view are being considered and uh, put into politics. And because that doesn't always work well, people are trying to divide pow power by engaging into many more political parties. So basically we get this kind of splitter parliaments uh, where we have a lot more parties represented than previously because people want to have a new kind of governance which is about collective intelligence. And I will explain it in a minute. And you also may remember that uh, final speech of Lambert, who was the president of the, the Bundestag, who warned that democracy was in danger. He must know what he was talking about. And in fact, a surprise happened, and um, eventually the parliament emancipated themselves. At least in one uh, question, there was this question about uh, marriage for all where basically everyone was allowed to take a vote according to their personal point of view and not party discipline. And I think that should happen all the time, actually. And uh, we had times where parliaments were run in such a way that everyone was just taking the decision that they were most convinced of and that has changed over time. Now, we have to become better. Why is this? Because we have really pressing problems. We have the sustainability problem around the world. If we don't solve it, we'll be in big trouble. Conflicts, wars, and bad things cr like crisis will happen. That's why we have the United uh, Nations uh, 2030 goals. It's 12 years, and even 11 just ahead of us. And if we don't get it fixed, then basically this is what will happen to world population. That means people will die early. So there will be a lot of stress on all countries around the world. And that's why we need to build better systems that uh, basically have more carrying capacity, that can provide more quality of life for more people. And if you don't manage to do this, then this is going to happen. And you can see that happen already in a number of countries, I guess. So the pressure is here. So what can we do? I think we can upgrade democracy digitally. And this is all about collective intelligence. I mean, bringing the knowledge and ideas of many people together. A politician should be representing not just particular interests of certain groups of people, but of the entire country, and also global interests as well. So how do we bring the best ideas of many minds together? We basically need online deliberation platforms where people discuss and arguments are being collected. But this is about identifying different points of view and the logical dependency of different arguments. And this is not how Facebook and Twitter and so on works today. So once those different perspectives have been identified, they would be put together in innovative integrated solutions that would try to take care of as many points of view as possible. And this is important because whenever it comes to complex systems, it's, it's not the best individual solution that wins, but it's diversity, it's the integration of different solutions that wins. Have a look at uh, Wikipedia about this Netflix prize. <laughs> what happened is when the very best individual solution was combined with other solutions that were inferior, the resulting solution was even much better than the best individual solution. And we observed that for many 
solutions to complex problems. So social intelligence is something that matters, collective intelligence. And now people are always asking, should we give more weight to better educated or more intelligent people or whatever? And the answer is, experiments say no. This is very surprising. This is very surprising, but it's also good news for democracy in a sense. So it's really important to have these different points of views and integrate them. It's not about majority determining the fate of minorities. It's about trying to learn from each other and integrate the knowledge. So we have to go away from this kind of model where we're shouting at each other and trying to turn people's points of view. To but we need to learn to listen. And this is, of course, where big data can help. Um, the public debate in social media allows you to identify where are the burning problems, what are the concerns. Then moreover, learn to see the world through the eyes of other people. And for example, with mixed reality, this can be done, right? So you can learn to see the world from other perspectives. Like if a man, you could see it from a woman's perspective. If a Christian, you could see it from a Jewish perspective or so, right? That technology will be there. Moreover, take different perspectives and then integrate different solutions. And those integrated solutions should then enter a race, a fair race, in order to identify the best integrated solution. So competition needs to be combined with cooperation across parties, also beyond coalitions. And I think we should have a new format of organizing policies would be projects to solve a particular problem. And those projects could be run by a political party together with other political parties, changing coalitions um, also beyond what we call coalitions today. And uh, civil society will become ever more important. A very nice example is actually this initiative in uh, Switzerland. So what they wanted to do is to treat foreigners differently from uh, people who were born in Switzerland to be able to kick them out more easily. But that had, would have created different law for different people and would have undermined the equality principle of democracy. Now, in the beginning, it appeared that the majority would support this. But then there was an engagement of civil society groups of all kinds that really turned the tides and finally save this equality principle of democracy. So engage with civil society and don't do it just during your campaigns. You should do that all over the four years of a government period. So involve people and that's basically the principle to be successful in the future. So be visionary, be courageous, be a game changer create opportunities for participation and build digital democracy. Thank you. Wow, how inspiring after the lunch. Uh, you gave us a lot of food for thought after, so this is uh, really good. But I would uh, take the opportunity to, to give like two or three questions a chance, but uh, we have to, uh, we have to Stay with Santiago's schedule, so we have to work on that. But two or more questions, so very well. Anyone? Here, yeah, please go ahead. How, how does... But you have to use the mic, please. Well, Tom, do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. Okay. How does um, the um, government 4.0 would look like, like in real life? How would that module look like? Like how, how, how would voting look like? Like, can you explain it like in a more kind of visionary view than just a picture? Yeah, I, I, I guess yeah, we would get away from campaigning and doing politics in iteration, but we would always have to explain what we're doing. 
um, all over the four years of uh, government period. And uh, we would always have to engage with the people. Um, I think we should have a new format where we don't have kind of the, the ministries deciding everything that happens in a certain sector, but we should have a format that engages with civil society where people could come up with proposals, what kind of projects uh, could be implemented, and those proposals that uh, get public support and should be implemented. And it shouldn't matter whether um, this is just the opinion of the strongest political party or whether there are other political parties coming in to support such a project. So, you know, we could have kind of several hundred projects within a four-year government period, and some of them might be um, bringing uh, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats uh, together, and in, in others maybe FDP would be in, or the Green Party, or even the a AFP. So basically, you know, every corner of society that has a justified uh, interest would have opportunities to contribute to shaping and improving our society. And that means really a reorganization of the way we organize politics. And so I'd like to trigger that kind of discussion over here to think beyond what we have been doing in the past and how we have been doing it. So in a word, just more folks in China? Uh, I think that's More also kind of a, a referendum. It's, 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 it's also an intermediate thing, um, right? It, it, it's still not taking civil society on board as creative, innovative, shaping force. And I think we should be doing this. We should be learning how to do that continuously. I think we have two more questions, but. I think like a campaign strategist like like Tom Pitfit would like to see that happening actually because it's constant campaigning, right? <laughs> so it's an outreach program uh, beyond uh, even imaginable. So we have a question over here. Yeah, yes. I had a question related to how do you deal with the bias of um, yeah facts versus emotions, eh? and who has then the role of yeah, informing so that people can take the right decisions? And we take one more question in the back there, and then we. Unfortunately, I, I do personally think that emotions are important, but we need to be careful with them. So it's really a matter of political culture that uh, we try to stay on, on the positive side of emotions because emotions can be terribly uh, misused and turned against the interests of, of people and against peace. So uh, things have become pretty shaky over here, partly because tools of information warfare have found their way into political campaigning and I think this is not a good development altogether and uh, we need to understand that for uh, a society to thrive politics is not about victory but it's about identifying good ideas and helping to make them come reality, right? And so we need to rethink really what kind of institutions we have, why we have them, and how they should be working in, in order to develop them further with digital means and make sure that this is not really against us. Hi, um, I'm someone working in Parliament, and thank you for inviting presentation. I I see from a you know practical practical point of view, what you're missing out is a the role of bureaucracy. You know, it's just a vote. You know, voting for your term. See, once you have government, you have you know the um, civil servants working in bureaucracy, making laws, and sometimes these people are real people within power and with power. So. In all your models, you're missing out this factor, you know, because of bureaucracy. And the second is, I think, problem with your presentation. Um, civil society is all good, and direct democracy, I'm all for it, but civil society and direct democracy undermine the authority of voted 
members of parliament. These are the only ones with authority in the political process and within the parliament. And <coughs> sorry, so where 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 are the voted and elected members in your model? The old question of democracy representation right. and who is yeah. who is actually enforcing. So the question about administration, is it a problem of my presentation or is it a problem of administration? <laughs> so I do think that with the digital revolution also administration will change a lot. Now regarding the authority of parliamentarians, um, I'd like to remind you that the sovereign is the people and not the parliament. Yeah, we, we should be in power, and politicians are the people we pay to work in our interests. So they should be coordinating activities in this country or in other countries also in such a way that our interests are being taken care of. And I realize that there is kind of a different perspective amongst uh, some politicians. So, you know, they should shape history, they should be powerful and so on. And I think. This kind of politics has driven the world into a very dangerous situation uh, where we realize that with climate change, with conflicts around the world, with financial crisis and unemployment and, and sustainability crisis, you know, this kind of system is not sustainable. It, it hasn't really made it into the kind of future that we'd like to see and that's why we need to rethink the system and reform it in such a way that it serves us better than before. And I think this kind of debate is just about to start, but it will have to lead us to, to new and better solutions. And we always need, I believe, politicians, but uh, we will have different frameworks of organizing this engagement. Upgrading democracy for the digital age. Thank you very much, Professor Eddy.